Hello, all you hard calls. I'm joined by Julian. How are you doing, Julian? I'm all right, Russell. I'm all right. It's been a good bank holiday. And uh, I think we've got some work to do late tonight, mate, and we've got to put this thing to bed. Yeah, let me just play this before we start. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes, that was. Right, so I just want to clarify something. Andy Aylin from Frank Warren um, staff told me last night that at the rules meeting there were discussions about Correct. what a low blow is. Correct. I then asked Team Usyk the same question as if there was no discussion about uh, low blow. Well, um, again, uh, I don't believe the rules meetings was recorded, but what was recorded, the referee came to our dressing room prior to the fight to read us our rules. And he asked us at the end of it, do you have any questions? I said, yes, I have. I said, can you make sure that Usyk's uh, groin guard finishes where it's supposed to finish? He, he's known for wearing his shorts extremely high above where it should be. So we've got the recording of that. You, you've got that? We right? have got the recording of that, yes. We're going to put it out? Most definitely. It's evidence. Most definitely. Send it to me, I'll put it out. Most definitely. There you go. IFL will put it out for, for a Mr. Neutral IFL Umar. So I've not caught up on too much of this today. You've sent me a couple of bits. Yeah. It's all getting a little bit silly now, isn't it? You know, the, the whole thing's getting silly. So first of all, when you've got a heavyweight championship of the world or any major title fight, you might have several meetings with a referee, but the actual official rule meeting is the most important one. And for obvious reasons, that's not record, recorded. We can't start recording everything now. If they've had, a, had an abbreviated meeting, what they're, they're saying they've recorded, that's fine. Show us it. Put on IFL. IFL are loving the controversy. They'll also get some views over this because it, this conversation is going viral. It's almost like it's going to become folklore in 30 years' time. Well, like John Fury's gone under the no on hard road. Well, it'll be like this uh, when, you know, Angelo Dundee tore Ali's glove against Henry Cooper and people were saying he gave him a four minutes in between in between the fourth and fifth round, when the reality is I think it ran over by about four seconds, five seconds. It was a one-minute five interval. It becomes folklore. Now, listen, you can have as many rules meetings as you want. Yeah, that's... All well and good. Fill your boots. Send in what videos you want. Have as many hearings as you want. Complain as much as you want. Get as much airtime as you want. What happens on the night is completely different. What happens on the night is the referee, in the split second, without the advantage of watching this from three or four or five camera angles, over and over again, he made a call. And the call he made was it was a low blow. Whether it was the right call or the wrong call, that was the call that he made at the time. And Alexander Usyk responded accordingly to that call. As soon as he knew it was a low blow, he stayed down. He knew he could take some time out. Had he been dropped and the referee had started counting, we would have then seen, we would have saw what happened. Alexander Usyk would have got up. Would he have continued? Would he have come back and won that fight? Would he have got stopped? We don't know. But what we do know is we deal with what we know. And what we know are two things. One thing, the referee called a low blow. The second thing we know, and it's funny how some of the people, Russell, who I know that you've you've had issues with over the year, like Tony Bellew and Dave Caldwell, they're actually getting this right. Tony Bellew, the one thing I did hear about today was Tony Bellew on Talk Sport. He called this right. He called this exactly what it was. It was a one-sided drubbing. Dubois got absolutely drubbed one-sided. He didn't jump all over Usyk when the referee did wave the fight on. But ultimately, in the eyes of the rule book, it's a low blow. And anything below the navel, you get hit by a 17, 18 stone heavyweight puncher wearing 10 ounce gloves. It's going to make your eyes water. And that is it. Yeah, it's uh, the the... I think Bellew, I don't usually agree with a lot of what he says, but the narrative now is about milking more out of Dubois because basically he's at the bottom of the queue now, isn't he? Yeah. Well, this might not... Listen, you know I'm not a football man, don't you? You know football's not my sport. Mm -hmm. But I do remember the hand of God. Now, the hand of God, I'm not going to compare too much to this because 
you know, Maradona, he blatantly cheated, right? But what I'm saying is the referee at the time saw what he saw and he ruled it was a goal for Argentina. But what we do know, and this is going to sting because I'm not a footballer, but I talk to a lot of people who love the sport. I know a couple of football coaches. Argentina were the best team in the 1986 World Cup. And that's a fact. Yeah, They were a better team than England. Whether the referee got it wrong or right, we know at the time he got it wrong. Maradona subsequently you know, said, yeah, I did use my hand. But ultimately... Argentina were the best team in that World Cup. But what he did after, though, it's second goal. I'm just going to say, oh, the gen- this is this is why I'm, I am I like to use an analogy. And then the genius of that second goal, for someone who's not a football fan, the, the guy single-handedly just destroyed England and he scored that absolutely stinging goal. It was a brilliant, brilliant goal. We then sank England. England had an opportunity to come back, like Dubois had an opportunity to come back. It didn't happen. And Argentina went on to win the World Cup in 1986 because they were the best team in the bloody tournament. Yeah. Right? That's just not being paid. I'm not overly patriotic when it comes to fact. Right? And I don't know anybody who thinks that England that night were a better team than Argentina. I don't know anybody who thinks England would have won that World Cup in 1986. It's now consigned to history. There was no cheating from Usyk, but there was... There was Cheating from Maradona, but what I'm saying is ultimately, no VAR, the referee made the call, and that was it. And then that was down to England, wasn't it, to get another yeah. get another goal and another goal and another goal. So the referee made the call for Danny Dubois on Saturday night. He said it's a low blow. Dubois felt aggrieved, right? Get you get your head together, get your act together. When he waves time, put the pressure on, let your hands go. Don't go down to a knee after taking a jab. Let your hands go. So I'm sorry. You've got yourself to blame. That's harsh. That's how I look at it. Well, there were two minutes, 36 seconds left in the round five. Now, if he's it, Usyk, with a body shot, and in his head he's saying, I hurt him, it with a body shot, it with a body shot. Why don't you just jump on him then? I know I know they had that break and that, but Dubois had had a break as well, hadn't he? Sometimes you just got to let your hands go, haven't you? It was still in one punch at a time, all night, right onto the body. Right Food and drink, wasn't it, for Usyk, that fight, it was, wasn't it? It was just, if you look at that holistically as the whole fight, and this is what frustrates me, okay, because they're using this, this angle, and I understand partly where they came from on the night, but they're going to use this and use this and use this, They've ultimately, Frank Warren, uh, Don Charles, and everybody who's involved in Daniel Dubois' career, forget the money, what he will have earned. They've all let him down. Why have they let him down, Russell? Because they've put him in an heavyweight championship of the world fight, and he's ill-equipped to take on a great champion. Yeah. You can argue with that he'd never be equipped to take on Usyk, and I'll accept that argument. But how much improvement have we seen in Daniel Dubois since he turned pro? How much improvement have we seen him in the last two or three years? How many good learning fights? You hear me say this all the time about Anthony Joshua, don't you? Mm. How many good learning fights has Dubois had? They haven't developed him. How many times has Frank Warren put his hand in his pocket to get him a really good quality 10 round so he can learn? How many times have they put their hands in the pocket to send Dubois abroad to spar with some of the best fighters in the world? How many times have they done that? I'm not saying it's never happened, but how much actual investment have they put in to Daniel Dubois' development as a fighter? And I would suggest none, because all you've done is you've just now put him straight in with a guy like Usyk and wipe away that one punch that everybody's talking about. The guy was so out of his depth, it was untrue. He didn't have a clue what he was doing. He never really closed the distance down. The head movement people, I think Gareth A. Davis said something about his head movement was improved. And I'm like, are these guys on drugs when they say stuff like this? Are they, do they actually mean this? Because it looks to me the easiest fighter in the world to hit, does the bar. Yeah. He's got no head movement. And people always make the mistake of talking about head movement. It's one thing having head movement. But if you haven't got good feet and good foot movement and good hand movement and good body co- coordination and know five, six, seven different ways to defend a particular shot. If you haven't got that, it doesn't mean anything. Moving your head doesn't mean a lot if you're not doing all the other things you're supposed to do. So for me, they've put him in with a, a killer, an absolute killer, 
and he's had the fight punched out of him and he got hammered and he got wiped out. And what are they going to do? Are they going to, I mean, if you think about how ridiculous this is now, Russell, right? Yeah. They care that much about Daniel Dubois. As I've just said, he's so ill-equipped to fight Usyk. They're going to put him in with him again. Is that how much they care about this guy? What about saying, I'll tell you what, okay, look, we'll do that one down the line. Talk to the WBA. We'll do it down the line. Let's do Usyk and Fury. They're so confident that Fury is going to get that win anyway. And then down the line, give Dubois a shot at the undisputed title. Why not do that? Let's say, okay, we're going to go back to the drawing board because, you know, there were some improvements in Dubois. I don't think so, but they'll say there were some improvements in Dubois. In Dubois. Let's work on this. Let's work on that. Let, let's get him in the States. Let's get him in the US. Look at, you know, what Joshua was doing, whether it's working or not. Get him in the US. Get him with some of these real quality world-class coaches. Get him some great sparring. And let's bring him back in a big fight in two years' time. In the, in the, in the medium time, in the mid-time, let the guy learn. Let's build his confidence back up. But no, what they're going to do, they're going to do exactly the same thing that they did with Anthony Joshua and Usyk, put him back in, crush his confidence. The guy's crumbling. The guy fell to pieces. David Price got knocked out by Tony Thompson, put him straight back in with an immediate rematch. This is not how you develop fighters, mate. And they're going to put him in with Usyk again. Let's just say the call for a rematch. I don't think they will. But let's just say they call for a rematch. I think there are grounds for a rematch. Dubois is just going to get tanked again. He's going to get tanked again. He's going to get stopped again. And where does he go from there, Russell? Who really cares about Daniel Dubois? Let's be honest. Well, since Joe Joyce, uh, since the Joe Joyce fight, he's had one, two, three. He's had four fights and uh, 25 minutes action. And they've been against uh, Bob Dan Dino, Joe Cusimano, like, sounds like somebody out at Sopranos, Trevor Bryan, Feather Duster Man, and Kevin Lorana, who he took three counts against. The bar down three times in the first round, Le Lerona down twice prior to the stoppage. Uh, that was a shootout, basically. That fight, wasn't it? We a small southpaw. I mean, those guys. That li the list of those guys, in spite of what they might tell us in the build-up to those fights. I mean, it's poor. I mean, well, I look at it like this. Let me just tell you this. I look at it like this. Right, his career has been what they call in the industry, right? Matchmakers. I used to deal with on a daily basis with Dennis. They call it. Matchmake, ma uh, box rec matchmaking. Because if you look, he's fought seven guys who were undefeated. So yeah. the, the record looks very attractive, doesn't it? You know, when you go through it all. But when you scratch the surface, it's pure rhubarb, isn't it? The CV. Well, it was the guy, like the guy who Fraser Clark beat, who was unbeaten, wasn't it? He boxed the kid who had four or five fights. And even Fraser Clark was just kind of like, oh, it was, it was so embarrassed with that performance. You're I think pretty he honest, Fraser, though, wasn't he about it? Yeah, I think he said he stopped the guy in the first round and was like, oh, this is just like, and this is all about paper records. And this is the danger of the, the industry that we're in right now, because these paper records mean absolutely nothing, do they? They're just dire. So they'll point to the fact that these guys are unbeaten. But if you look under the microscope, who these guys are unbeaten against, I mean, Daniel. What was he called? Daniel Bryan, right? I just think, I just call him Judy Bryan. I mean, I'm sure in my age, the in the 80s, so prison cell by cage, there was a big fat woman in, in prison cell by cage called Judy Bryan, and she couldn't fight for toffee, and she, she thought she couldn't, she was useless. And he was just like Judy Bryan, is Daniel Bryan. He was, he made, he made Charles Martin look like Jack Johnson, did that guy. Yeah. You know, I we, we give Charles Martin some stick, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And then along came Judy Bryant, and I thought, well, do you know what? That's probably, regular champion or not, that's probably the worst champion I've seen at any weight who's held some kind of belt. It was absolutely abysmal. So these aren't learning fights. These are joke fights, and you, you're going to put him in again with Usyk. You're going to get him beat up again with Usyk, why? Why would you do that? Who, who, who really? What? What will happen then if Usyk tanks him again? Because he will. He'll tank him again. 
Then you've got a fighter then who's had his third damaging defeat. You try rebuilding in that fighter. We've seen what's happened with Anthony Joshua, and I think Anthony Joshua is a lot more talented than Danny Dubois. But we've seen what's happened with Joshua when they put him back in with a killer. The guy's fragile now. He's, yeah. he's scared of his own shadow. Usyk does, does that to him. Look at what uh, Bradison though. He's not the same guy now, is he? He just breaks them down. You know, you, you you think you're the bee's knees until you get in with a guy like him, who's naturally two or three stone lighter than you naturally, I say. And he's just pinging you left, right and centre and you can't move him and you must think, wow. And we all saw Anthony Joshua, didn't we, after that second fight, how he behaved. He almost had like his mental breakdown in the ring. Because, and look at him now, he's so fragile now. He's, his psyche is so delicate now. And we're going to do that to Daniel Dubois, does does that kid not deserve a little bit better than that? I mean, push for a rematch against Usyk. He landed one punch all night, and that one punch was deemed as being a low blow. Are we really going to push for that rematch? Well, the vultures are circling, and they're trying to alter people's minds on what they saw. I, I can't believe. I mean, we have we had a dig, don't we? We have a dig at Eddie Hills and his little cronies. For trying to push the narrative out on uh, on the internet with all the little the Umars and all the rest of them, Coogans and Nicholas Parsons, the job lot. But yeah. I've never seen Bricktop and his merry men come out, and I mean come out and just swamp in social media with interviews. I mean Don Charles has done more interviews in the last forty eight hours than he's done in his whole career. The man's normally a mouse. Just, you've seen more of it than I have because, I, as you know, I can't watch a lot. I watch enough to form an opinion, to, to spend time on here and, you know, get some kind of balanced opinion. But I struggle watching it all. So I'll see the headlines come up on YouTube and I see Frank Warren's red face and his raging and some kind of clickbait headline, I think. I'm, I'm struggling what his argument is. I'm struggling what his argument is. And anybody who's watching this say, look, Jules, you, you know, you, you come across often as someone who knows what he's talking about. You're talking rubbish. What do you mean you can't see what his argument is? I can't see what his argument is because the referee ruled it was a low blow. And under the rules of boxing, the technical rules of boxing, it's a low blow. What, what are we discussing this for? I don't, I don't get it when... Louis Pabon said, right, Osek's gone, oh, and he's going to stay down. He, straight away, he went across with his arms, across his waist, as if to say, right, that's a yep. foul. So Osek's then going to play the game, isn't it? He? He's going to think, well, I've been it low, I'm going to take a breather here. But Absolutely. he as well done in Jabbar. And then yeah. he then made a motion to the judges to say, unintentional foul, which we all missed on. Bricktop's just going on about it two hours ago, I've just seen on TalkSpot, although I think they interviewed him at dinner time. He's going, well, why didn't they take a point off? The referee clearly made the a judgment to the commissions that that's an unintentional foul, then. So that's why he didn't take a point off, because it was unintentional. Now, the rest of it, they're trying to muddy the waters. And the fans get so aggravated by this. That it's like... Boxing is the only sport where people lose the shit in it over stuff this, like this. This is this is what people uh, where it just becomes ridiculous. You can tell I'm frustrated with this because, for example, I was listening to Tony Bell. You spoke really well. Um, you and I will always say that whether the York Cup of tea or not, if someone speaks well, whether they've got an agenda or not is irrelevant. If they speak well and they're right, they're right. And Bell, you said exactly the same as what Carl Froch just said said exactly the same as what Billy Nelson said, right? These guys are telling you the rules of boxing. Now, people have started saying like, so Don Charles has said that Usek is known for wearing his shorts really high. What? Now, this is where it becomes ridiculous, right? Because belt protectors, they're kind of, they're not all standard. They have slightly different brands and different makes of belt protectors. But when you put your belt protector on, it covers your groin and obviously there's a waist band, right? Yeah. Generally, within boxing rules, you can't suddenly decide to have a, a six-inch waistband on that groin protector what's made out of foam, leather and foam. You can't have a six-inch waist. So it's a standard thing. And you can't pull these things up. They're not... 
They're not Mr. Pickwick's trousers that you can pull up to your chest, these belt protectors. You can't pull them up. As soon as it fits over your groin, it's not like a pair of boxer shorts what stretch. As soon as you put this over your groin, it sits where it sits. And then what you do, you do the old coach's trick, okay? You get some duct tape. You put the duct tape around the groin protector. Then you twist it and you go around a couple of times so it's sticky. And as I'm looking at that groin protector on your thumbnail there, then you pull the shorts up and you stick it to the duct tape, all right? And that's where it sits. It's a standard groin protector that has got on. Are we saying now that it's got a groin protector that the waist is three inch, four inch higher than standard? It's rubbish. Well, this is what they're all wearing now, Russell. They're all wearing it because if you think of sport and you think of American football and you think of cricket and, and you think of the old pads and the old protectors that they used to wear, they were inadequate, weren't they? Because sports science has got so much better. So when Greenhill and Everlast and all these top brands of boxing equipment are making this stuff, they're making it because it's safer. They're making this stuff within standard measurements and standard metrics because it's safer. They're not making it so some guy can have his bloody shorts up to his up to his his, his chest. They're making them to standard specifications and making them safer. And he's just he's wearing it no higher than probably ninety five percent of the boxes that you see out there. And this is because they've been designed. I'm hammering the point home. They've been designed a certain way now. As I've said, the small groin cups that they used to have back in the 30s and 40s didn't protect. They only protected the genitals. They didn't protect the bladder. They didn't protect the lower the lower organs. They just protected the genitals. It wasn't enough. So now they make them a certain way that it protects danger areas. Danger areas. And this is what Tony Bellew said. You get hit below the navel. Never mind hitting the bollocks. You get hit below the navel. It's really, really painful. It's almost like one zone, isn't it? It's like you get hit there. These these protectors, boom, it pulls everything in. It pulls everything in. There isn't a lot of room in those groin protectors for your nuts. So you get hit there, which is what Tony Belly was trying to say. It hurts. It hurts. It's not a body shot. It hurts. The whole groin thing hurts. And this is what people are not getting either because, again, it sounds patronised, either because they don't understand the rules of boxing or they're not close enough to boxing to know how this stuff works. All sex. Well, well maybe all sex uh, protector isn't any isn't just a normal protector. It's not any old protector. It's probably a super groin protector. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, uh, you see it all the time, don't you? I mean, the, the classic coach for that is Joe Gallagher. Every time Joe Gallagher, he used to do it on purpose to wind people up. Joe Gallagher, and I know Joe, Joe's a good guy and he knows me and you know Joe. Joe Gallagher's fighters have their groin protectors just like everybody else's. Right? But Joe goes to the front of the ring. First thing he does is comment to the referee about how, how high the other guy is. It's, it's gamesmanship about how high the other guy's groin protectors are. You know, some fighters do have them too high, but, you know, it's just, everyone's got different body types as well, haven't they? Some people have short trunks. Some people have longer trunks. So it makes it look as though it's lower down. We've all got different body types, but it's just gamesmanship. It was technically a low blow. You can do as many diagrams as you like, and you can look at as many angles as you like, Technically, it was a low blow because it was below the belly button, in between the belly button and the top of the hip bones. It's called the belt line, and it was on or below the belt line. Technically, it's a low blow. And don't just look at the center of the glove where that goes on the belt line. Gloves, heavyweight gloves, are big surface areas. Draw a line from the center of a glove and then look at the bottom of the glove and the top of the glove. That's a big surface area that's impacting. And that it was that looked, as well, the punch, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was coming up. It threw the shot, it was coming up. It was that that would have hurt. That would have pulled the box in, the protector in, into the bladder, pulled the groin up. That would have bloody hurt, mate. I'm telling you. Uh brick tops come out on talk sport and other outlets. He's he's declaring it a no contest, and he says. 
he doesn't see uh, any problem why the WBC won't do the same or at least order a rematch. Do you think he's trying to put words in the mouth like Eddie did with drug testing situation with Ben? I would say so. Um, you sometimes get to a situation, don't you, where certain promoters have big name fighters in their portfolio. So at the moment, Frank Warren's got Tyson Fury. So he's probably feeling that it carries more weight with the organisation and sanctioning bodies than he actually does. And this this happened, didn't it, with Eddie Hearn? You know, Eddie Hearn's probably thinking, I've got a lot of officials coming over every single year onto my shows or all over the world. And come on, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? But And I think this is exactly what Frank Warren's doing, is, is trying to flex his muscles. But the last place, and I'll keep repeating this, the last place Danny Dubois wants to be right now is in another fight with Alexander Usyk. Because the one thing that Usyk has done, even though I think he's getting slightly, he's aging slightly, he's now shaken off whatever ring rust he had, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, they said he finished after the Cruiserweight tournament, didn't they? They said he were, getting, were aging and he'd stayed in amateurs too long and that. And it didn't look like that when he fought Joshua, did he? Well, I don't, I don't, he might have been slightly Adrian Russell, but he's, he's that fat, he's that much better than these guys. You know, he could, he could be 38, 39, and I think he still beats pretty much every heavyweight apart from Tyson Fury. I think he's just too good for these guys. I mean, if they do put the bar in with him again and it ruins him, what does it say about them all? Are they all just pimping him out? It's all about get rich now, get rich quick. Let's do anything we can to avoid the Tyson Fury and Usyk thing. Because if you notice one thing as well, Fury's fighting Angano, and it's just taking the spotlight away from that fight for a few weeks, isn't it? Because we all know it's a stinking fight. It's one that's had people in uproar about. And had Usyk stopped Dubois in three rounds on Saturday, there'd be immense pressure now, wouldn't they, on Fury to fight Usyk and say, come on, you're fighting this joker guy. This MMA guy, it's a joke, and you, and you, here's Usyk. But now this has been a brilliant, brilliant opportunity for them to just kind of like divert people's attention. Let's divert people's attention to Alexander Usyk, who's a cheat. Alexander Usyk, who now, yeah. he sat there, he sat down, and he didn't want to carry on, and he's got the referee on his side. It's just diversion tactics away from what really truly matters which is we've got two dominant heavyweights in the world who should have boxed by now, and it's an embarrassment that they haven't. And deep down, we all know the reason, whether people like this or not, the vast majority of the reason for this is because Tyson Fury didn't want that fight. Yeah. Uh, the Don, Don Charles has, well, I've seen nine interviews and counting, and there's more. Don Charles has come out and he's saying Usyk's a cheat. Uh, he always has been. It's been going on for years. Do you think they're trying to soil his character? Well, I think you lose credibility when you come out and say things such as that. So I know, for example, you, right? You're a massive Usyk fan, yeah? Yeah. I like him. He's not my favourite fighter in boxing. I like him. I respect him. I admire him. I think his personality is unbelievable. He's hilarious. But I'm not as big a Usyk fan as you are, as some other people out there. But when you got a guy who's done what he's done as an amateur, I won't go through what he's won as an amateur because he just takes too long. And then you get a guy like him who's it been, takes too long. It takes too long. He's won everything, and and he's a unified cruiserweight champion, as we know, and he holds the majority of the belts. Undisputed cruiserweight. And he's just, he's just. The, the one of the probably one of the three or four best fighters in boxing of all all weight categories, and is the guy also who's got integrity, and is a guy also who's campaign campaigning at heavyweight. He's fight he's boxing fighters out of his natural weight. He's a cruiserweight who's stepped up for bigger challenges, and we're going to start slurring his character. We're going to start saying he's a cheat. Well, actually, he's a fake. Is this? Is that the other? I mean, it's just. It's just horrendous, isn't it, really? I mean, you you just don't do yourself any favours when you talk knackers like that. Don Charles also mentioned, and I want to touch on this because I'm quite chuffed that I picked up on this, mate. I, some people say you look for negative, Russell, but 
I did say uh, when I first uh, did one of a night, I said, look, Don Charles needs to get ready for his P45. This is boxing. First you're angry, then you're upset, then you look for somebody to blame. He knows when, when in the cold art light of day, wants to sit or sit, once they all sit down, DeBar's team without him there, because that's what happens, and they have a meeting, he'll know that he'll be copying it. Do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. Because really, I mean, I get him round five because I thought, well, you'd have, you'd have to do because of controversy. But if you look at the round, actually, really, what did he do in round five? If it's if that's classed as a low blow, you couldn't give him round five, could you? No. The, so he, didn't only... a, he didn't win a round. We're supposed yeah. to have had. Don Charles said on Wednesday, and I quote, he's stronger now, he's got better head movement, and he's a better fighter, and he's punching harder. Better head movement. Those left crosses from Usyk were going straight through the guard, weren't they? They were catching him straight through the guard, knocking him on his heels, knocking his equilibrium over to his left. Better head movement. Well, the, the one thing that you, you are supposed to do as a fighter who, who dips and dips and dips his head, when you're fighting a master like Usyk, is you're supposed to punch off the dips. You know, you drop your right shoulder, you come up with a right uppercut. You drop your left shoulder, you come up with a left uppercut, a left hook. You drop both shoulders and you slip down, you come up with a cross hook. Where was this stuff? Where was the follow-up after the right hand to the body? Where was the left hook to the head that dropped that left hook back down to the body? Where were these combinations? We keep seeing combinations, what fighters keep doing on the pads, don't we? And you get these clickbaits from IFL saying, so-and-so smashes the pads at the public workout. And we saw these combinations that Dubois was throwing and people saying, look so trim. And look at him, he's throwing those multiple shots to the body and finishing to the head. Where was the application of that? And before anybody says it's easier said than done against Usyk, where was the attempt to even do that? Where was the fifth round when you believe you've hurt him with a legitimate shot? Where's that... Real push, you know, the, the, the basic things that you teach professional fighters, it's slightly different when you coach amateurs and pros. But when you're working with pro fighters, there are basic things that you teach. And, you know, fighters generally fight at three ranges and three heights. But where, where were the moments where Dubois was dropping down? He was putting his weight onto his, onto his front foot, onto his back foot, coming, up, coming underneath the line. You know, you, you see Mike Tyson... Come under the line, stick, stick, stick. And he would like pop, pop, pop like that. You know, he would come under the line, step to the left, come up with a left uppercut, come under the right, under the line, the right hand to the body, switch southpaw and a right uppercut. Where was the punches off the off the slips? Talk, talking about head movement when you're out of range and you move your head when you're out of range. You're supposed to move your bloody head when the guy's throwing punches at you when you're in range. I know I'm going on about the coaching side of things because it's the bit that frustrates me, but it's no good moving your head when you're out of range. Oh, he's moving his head a lot better. You move your head when you're inside the shot. When you're inside the shot, you drop your head there, you drop your head there, you get inside that southpaw lead arm. That's what Mayweather does. He never moves his head when he's out of range, does he? Because there's no point, is there? No point. No it's coming at you, is there? You don't need to. You move. You move your head. You drop your shoulder. I call it drop your shoulder. It's because people say you move your head. You don't move your head. You move your body, don't you? So we've all got a cent center axis, for example. I know I'm sat down. I'm kind of showing this thing, but you don't move your head like that. Like you know, sometimes you see fighters moving the head like that, and I think there's actually no such thing, Russell, as moving your head. Fighters don't move the head. Fighters move the body. Fighters move the body outside the line, and. Where was that? So you move the body, okay? You're fighting a southpaw. Easier said than done. You step out to the left. You dip your left shoulder. You throw a left hook, okay? He throws the backhand. You step under the backhand. You step out to your right. You double step your feet. You throw a right hand over the top. you got to gain ground against a guy like that, and you do that off the dip, off the slip, off the pivot. Where was this stuff? Why is nobody teaching him this stuff? Okay, he still might have had very little success because you're fighting a master, but you got to at least try this stuff. you got to at least try to do this stuff. 
Do you think he went into the fight with in his mind the mindset were we only need to catch him with one punch? He's been inactive 13 months. So they need to catch him with one punch because he's been inactive over a year. Do you think that was the only hope they had in, in L? Yeah, yes and no. Do you know what I think deep down? I think Dubois, like a lot of fighters, will have his moments of doubt. And I, I wonder if deep down he knew this was just like, look, I want, I want, I'm going to do the Usyk fight. We've got nowhere else to go. And they're just throwing me in. I wonder if deep down he really thought he was ready for that fight. Because he, does, he doesn't have that kind of look in his eyes, does he? He looks like a, a fighter who's quite unsure. I'm not talking about the stare out, but generally he just has a... He has a look about him, does Dubois. It might be just his, his features, but he looks like he feels sorry for himself. And he definitely looked like he was feeling sorry for himself. So whilst every fighter believes, you know, he's he's got believes in his own ability, fighters know when they're out of their comfort zone. Fighters know when they're outmatched Russell. You know, Sykes knew he was going to be outmatched against Broner. He knew that. He knew that. And I think deep down, and maybe I'm wrong, I think deep down, De Bras probably just thought, look, I'm, I'm being used a little bit here. I don't think I'm quite ready for it. Because other than that, right up to the body, right up a cup, if you want to call it a right up cup, do you think he ever really boxed with absolute conviction and let his hands go? No, no, I didn't. I think he boxed as if he, he, he gave him too much respect. To him. Like he never jumped on him, did he? He was tentative. And I know we always talk about this, but. Can you remember Lloyd Unigan's body language when he fought Don Curry? Yeah, he went after him, didn't he? Unigan went at him, didn't he? He's like, I don't care if you're the number one pound for pound fighter in boxing. I'm having you. Everybody's writing me off. I'm having you. And there was a mental mentality thing with Unigan that night. Nobody was going to stop Lloyd Unigan. You saw how he walked straight up to Don Curry, didn't he? Bump, bumped his nose, looked him down. He was bouncing. It was absolutely more up than anything I've ever seen. And that's the mentality that you got to have. And Dubois just looked tentative and taking his time and just looking for the perfect punch. I thought that was a fighter who, who knew he was in above his head. And anybody who says, well, I, I, what are you talking rubbish for? You know, he, he dropped Usyk and blah, blah. You got to got to forget that punch. You got to look at the fight in its all its context. He was well outmatched, well outmatched, and he never really, to me, looked like a confident fighter in that ring. No, it, uh, I, I feel for him in a way, but I do. Surely he must have his father. His his father must turn around and say, "Look, we got it wrong." Somebody's got because the dad's pulling the strings from behind the scenes, isn't he? He's got to say, "We got it wrong," because if not, did the father cash him out because of what happened in the Lorena fight? there's a good chance that that might have happened, you know. Um, I'm sure his dad loves him very much, but sometimes you you know the limitations that your fighter's got and you certainly know the limitations that you, your son's got. I don't know. Look, as I've said, sometimes you know you're going into a ring and you're up against it. You might feel confident, and there'll be other times if you speak to some pros deep down, they'll be like, I mean, who can ever forget? I know we've got a minute left on this, but who can ever forget Michael Spinks was one of the greatest light heavyweights who ever lived. But Michael Spinks knew what he was stepping into against Mike Tyson, which was why they delayed and delayed and delayed and got such the payday that they got against Tyson because they did it the right way because Spinks knew what was going to happen. And I think there was a certain inevitability for me what happened with Usyk and Dubois. And if he didn't have that mentality and he didn't think he could be he could be beat and he really thought it was going to, then why, why just take the count? Why take the count from a jab? Well, he's 26 next Wednesday. Do you think he could be washed up by, by the time he's 27? I think he's one stoppage defeat away from being washed up, Russell, and that'll be a rematch of Usyk. I think we're running out of time, buddy. I sent you two, didn't I, anyway? Yeah, let's do a second one, mate. Why not? All right. <laughs> 